Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. We're going to hear from um, Chris Wells now. Okay. That never happens with you guys. See that? Anyway. Um, <laughs> No feedback with sign language interpretation. It's just, it's just a perk. I'm just throwing it out there if anybody wants to. Um, Dr. Christopher Wells, uh, Chris, I, I, I sent the teeny weeniest little bio. It's just adorable. He's so modest. So I'll read that and then I'll tell you what he really does. So <laughs> Christopher Wells is an assistant professor and the director of programs and services at the Institute for Sexual Minority Studies and Services with Dr. Andre Grass. He is the co-founder of Camp Firefly which is Canada's largest leadership retreat for sexual gender minority youth. That's what's written here. The other things that I know, and some of you may know more than I, Chris has been um, extraordinarily effective and involved with the Edmonton Public Schools in working a thankless job, but quite tirelessly as far as I can tell, in trying to help classrooms be more inclusive and safer for children. He's been involved with Edmonton Police Service on all sorts of different levels, again, trying to make the community a safer place to be. He also champions individuals who wouldn't be able to um, effectively speak on their own behalf and lends some, you know, it's, it's nice to have the letters after your name, man. People listen to you. I got my LLB. He's got way more letters. Right? And he uses them selflessly to, make, to help people when they're on their path. And um, so we're lucky to have Chris. I mean, it's nice to have new kids on the block. We old people, you know, you get tired. <laughs> so Chris is going to map out for us um, the, the path ahead. Chris, thanks. Thank you, Julie. Um, first, before we begin, I got a little note about some housekeeping. Um, it's one of those many things that we, we do to keep things moving forward. Uh, just a note about photos that we're taking. Tonight is a history-making event as we celebrate 15 years um, on the long road towards equality. Um, so uh, I know Murray wants to take some photos. If there's anyone who doesn't want to take a photo, maybe a uh, good time to raise your hand and Murray will make sure not to capture you. Uh, Michael, <laughs> yeah, too late. <laughs> Just take Michael's good side. No back there. Any other no? Okay, so I'll stay away from that side. Everybody else roll. And thank you for <coughs> Great. I was asked to sort of talk about the local context. What has Vreend meant? Uh, over 15 years for us here in Alberta and where do we still need to go? What work is left? By no means have we achieved full equality in this province or in this country. So uh, over the next uh, 15 or 20 uh, minutes what I'd like to do is explore the impact of REND and how successful we've been here in Alberta translating moves towards legislative equality into social equality. And the example that I want to use is our K-12 school system to begin with. After all, schools lie at the heart of our communities. And schools are the primary vehicle in which we work directly to transmit our cultural values and beliefs to young people, who we really believe, I think, are the future of our communities and are often our hope for a more inclusive, humane, and just society. Vreend has had what we might consider a very deep impact on education, with many teacher associations and federations now actually having explicit policy providing not only protections to students, but to teachers as well against discrimination on the ground of sexual orientation. The, after the Vereen decision, probably the most dramatic and active response in Alberta was from the Alberta Teachers Association, who passed a series of policy resolutions developed a series of critical professional development resources, including workshops for teachers, and advocated strongly for the needs of sexual and gender minority students in Alberta schools. All of these policies were voted on at the ATA's annual representative assembly. And what that means is teachers from every corner of the province coming together over the May long weekend to deliberate, to discuss, and ultimately vote to shape the future of education in our province. And all of these policies were overwhelmingly passed by the teachers in our province. Unlike in British Columbia, where huge protests occurred in the 1990s when the British Columbia Teachers Federation sought to address sexual orientation in their policies, teachers here in Alberta have led the way. The first and most important change was the Code of Professional Conduct. 
which is the highest standard a teacher can be held accountable to in our profession. The very first item of the code states, like Barbara was talking about in section 15.1, that a teacher cannot discriminate on the basis of a number of personal characteristics like race, gender, language, culture, and now in 1999, one year after the Vereen decision, and as a direct result of the Vereen decision, sexual orientation was included. In 2003, the ATA became the first teacher association in Canada to include specific protections on the basis of gender identity. Here are Alberta teachers leading the country when it comes to terms of sexual orientation and gender identity. The ATA didn't stop there. They passed a number of policy resolutions, which you can see on the screen, supporting the rights of LGBTQ teachers to be protected, for sexual orientation and gender identity topics to be included in classroom curriculum, support for gay-straight alliances in high schools, recognition of same-gender parented families in our schools, even a call for faculties of education to include sexual orientation and gender identity in teacher preparation programs. And perhaps most importantly, was to recommend that all school boards in the province develop specific policies with sexual and gender minority students, staff, and families fully included and fully respected. So with these policies and resources in place, the ATA not only became one of the leading teacher organizations in Canada, but was ranked as one of the top three in the world in terms of its work in advocating and supporting for sexual and gender minorities. Unfortunately, for many years, the ATA stood alone, working in almost virtual isolation with no other educational partners or government agencies following them. What we've seen here is, is this example as uh, resources for gay-straight alliances. And last year we held the first gay-straight student alliance conference here um, with support from our faculty of education. And this year, on November 23rd, the second conference will be held in Calgary. And what's different at these conferences is the government is there and opening the conferences, largely due to the work of the ATA to talk about we need to be protecting and supporting all students. So in 2008, 10 years post Vreen, we saw the first signs of movement from the Alberta governments. With the small launch of new resources to address homophobic bullying, Alberta Education became the first education ministry in Canada to officially name homophobic bullying and to provide resources to address it. A door was slowly opening, but this still wasn't the great needed policy or legislative change. In 2011, from a small ray of light creeping through the crack in the door, a rainbow of hope began to appear, when largely thanks to a young and new progressive school board, Western Canada's very first standalone sexual orientation and gender identity policy was created by the Edmonton Public School Board. Here was a group of trustees who could actually remember their school experience and were shocked to learn that things still hadn't changed much from their own time in high school. Homophobia was rampant. In fact, some have called our public schools the last bastion of tolerated hatred towards sexual and gender minorities in our society. The passage of this policy did not come without significant resistance from backward forces, who at one point even threatened to sue the school district if the policy was passed. Undaunted and with great vision and courage, the school board unanimously passed the final policy in November 2011, and I know many people in this room were there to see that moment and spoke in favor of that policy. That was almost two years ago, and they've now passed specific administrative regulations and expectations of all 200 schools in the district. One key outcome of these regulations was to appoint and train at least one safe contact person on sexual orientation and gender identity issues in every school. And this was so vitally important because a network could be formed. I have a book in my office that talks about the gay liberation movement in the 1960s and it's entitled An Army of Lovers Cannot Fail. And that's what we need is an army, an infrastructure and a network in our schools to ensure that our students are safe, to ensure that they have someone that they can turn to. A three-year implementation plan is now in place. A superintendent's advisory committee has been established to monitor the policy implementation. And for the first time, Edmonton Public Schools 
has participated in Edmonton's Pride Parade Festival, with the board having been named the Pride Parade Grand Marshals in 2012 for their work. Great progress is occurring. Edmonton Public Schools is now seen as a leader in this work across Canada. And as a testament, the back to school story heard around the world this past September featured a brave and amazing Ren Kaufman, a pioneering 11 year old who transitioned genders with the full support of his family and the school district. These are the faces, these are the families that demonstrate how vitally important inclusive policy is to transformational change. At a time when we're electing new city councillors and school board trustees here in our city, we need to be vigilant and work to ensure that this kind of social progress moves forward, not backwards. Now this unfolding story brings us to the Alberta government. A government that has traditionally resisted sexual and gender minority inclusion at every turn. In fact, until very recently, every legislative change supporting sexual and gender minorities has not been given freely, but won through the courts. And as Dalwin has shown us, each and every time we've won. Fifteen years post greened what is left to accomplish on the legislative front in Alberta. I'd like to sketch out a few of the barriers to full and substantive equality that still remain. The first item is Alberta's Marriage Act. Here we are, ten years past the first court decision in Ontario, which Barbara mentioned, which legalized same-sex marriage. And Alberta's Marriage Act still shockingly contains a heteronormative and what some would even call homophobic preamble, which you can read up there, defining marriage as the foundation of family and from time immemorial a sanctified tradition between a man and a woman. Some question what legal force a preamble even has in legislation and how this preamble stands in clear and direct contradiction to federal law. Clearly this language is a relic of the past which must be changed. There can be no pretexts of two types of marriage. There can be no separate but equal. The next legislative challenge and the one we are currently grappling with all across Canada includes changes to birth certificates and other legal documents. For trans individuals to change their birth certificate here in Alberta, the government still requires proof of sex reassignment surgery, which presents huge barriers to many trans individuals, not to mention the rising number of trans youth who can't even access surgery, even if they wanted to. This legislation places these youth in a position of double jeopardy, where their right to confidentiality and their very safety can be violated by something as simple as a class attendance list or a school record that cannot be permanently altered without a change to their birth certificate. This legislation, which is problematically focused on biological sex rather than on gender identity and expression, is not only deeply flawed, it is offensive, as it undermines every individual's right to self-determination. As an example, Ontario, which had similar legislation in place, was forced to change its legislation after losing a landmark human rights complaint. And just this week, in British Columbia, thanks to, in large part to a brave 10-year-old trans girl from Victoria, the BC government has announced they would also change their legislation by the year's end. The response from our Minister of Service Alberta has simply been to state the Vital Statistics Act will be open for review in 2015. Your standard bureaucratic answer. At this very moment, I know personally of at least three human rights complaints that are in process or currently being filed against the Alberta government on this very issue. Will this be another case of having to take the government to court and win? Or will Alberta government do the right thing and change the legislation to support and protect some of our most vulnerable members of our society? The answer is yet unknown. Next, the issue most of us are familiar with, Bill 44, or Section 11.1 of Alberta's Human Rights Act. Finally, in 2009, a full 10 year, 11 years, a full 11 years after the Vereen decision, the Alberta government wrote sexual orientation into the province's human rights legislation. Unfortunately, this inclusion was what I call equality 
with an asterisk. Sexual orientation would go into the act, but not without the inclusion of parental opt-out provisions for any planned classroom discussion on sexual orientation, human sexuality, or religion. This was a case of a backhanded approach to equality, and clearly an affront, or what some have also called a profound sense of contempt for the spirit of the Vrend decision. The focus of the Vrend decision was, and still is, on e unqualified equality, not equality with conditions or codicils. Section 11.1 .1 of the Human Rights Act is inherently and deeply problematic. First, it was instituted without any public consultation. It's profoundly <coughs> undemocratic and the legislation is redundant and unnecessary. Parental protections have always been a part of the Alberta Program of Studies and teachers are skilled professionals who are trained to address so-called controversial issues in the classroom. Even in this legislation as it stands, what about gender identity? As the legislation is written, teachers need only parental permission to discuss sexual orientation, but one then would presume they are free to talk all they want about trans issues in the classroom. Perhaps we should start Trans 101 in schools tomorrow, <laughs> but just be sure not to talk about sexual orientation. What Section 11.1 .1 does, in effect, is to create a will to silence, as our famous French philosopher Michel Foucault might say, or a passion for ignorance around issues of sexuality and sexual orientation. The real question is, at what cost to our youth and to our society? This legislation marks and signals issues of sexuality and sexual orientation as so extraordinary that parental caution must be advised which in fact, when in fact, these issues should be considered as ordinary, as an everyday part of our classroom conversation, which reflects Alberta's increasingly diverse and pluralistic society. What Section 11.1 .1 does is build fences and barriers, as if sexual orientation was somehow a contagion. It centralizes and it naturalizes heterosexuality as normal, and therefore positioned, positions in others sexual and gender minorities as abnormal or deviant. In fact, what this legislation tells us is that heterosexuality is so insecure that it must be defended and protected in legislation at all costs. Section 11.1 .1 positions and conflates sexual orientation with a particular sexual behavior rather than, than understanding that sexual orientation is an identity. By conflating sexual orientation with sexual behavior, it quite shockingly associates gayness with sodomy. If we thought sodomy laws were no longer relevant in Canada, think again. The same logic is still very much alive in our legislature today. How does that old saying from Shakespeare go? I think thou dost protest too much, perhaps, with our legislatures. All this legislation has done is promote uncertainty. It's elicited self-censorship in the classroom and represents an incredible affront to the key tenets of public education, an educational system which should be inclusive of all, not just some students and families. So to conclude, what I'd like to propose are five recommendations for full equality of sexual and gender minorities in Alberta. The first is to remove the heteronormative preamble in the Marriage Act. The second is to amend the Vital Statistics Act to allow for self-determination and to ensure for the safety and well-being of our trans youth and adults. Third is to rescind the odious Section 11.1 .1 of the Alberta Human Rights Act and to stop this backhanded approach to equality in our province. Fourth is to explicitly include gender identity as a protected ground in Alberta's Human Rights Act. Like the written inclusion of sexual orientation, we know that visibility matters. It provides important social recognition that trans identities are fully included and valued in our society. And number five is to actively include sexual orientation issues and topics in our K-12 curriculum. Did you know that there's not one single mention of sexual orientation and gender identity 
anywhere in Alberta's K-12 program of studies. This happened in British Columbia and was found to be discriminatory. How can we exclude a whole group of people from our history books? Why isn't the Vren decision, which has been one of the most important decisions in the history of the Supreme Court of Canada, not taught in Alberta classrooms? What a travesty. What are we really teaching our children about diversity and difference in our society? And lastly, I snuck in a sixth item. Five was just more, um, more uh, poetic. <laughs> to follow the lead, our sixth recommendation is to follow the lead of Ontario and Manitoba and provide legislative support for the creation of gay, straight, student alliances in all Alberta schools, private, charter, Catholic, and public. Thankfully, things are changing. There is hope. The attitudes of Albertans are changing. This is a recent survey from Lethbridge College, which measured the views of Albertans on a number of hot-button social issues, which shows that Albertans are perhaps, as one author stated, maybe not rednecks, but more like pink necks. <laughs> as you can see now, 74% of Albertans now support same-sex marriage. This support has nearly doubled over the past 15 years. It's just about 76% of Albertans believe in the right to doctor-assisted suicide. More than 76% of Albertans believe marijuana should be legalized for medical purposes. What surprises me perhaps the most is over 80% of Albertans are pro-choice. The one issue on which Albertans did not seem to change their views was on capital punishment. With 60% of Albertans still supporting capital punishment for first degree murder. And if we want to think about changing attitudes, we only need to remember the last provincial election and the great burning lake of fire to know how most Albertans really feel. The question is, are our legislatures and our legislators listening? Are they willing to make the changes required to bring full equality to all Albertans? Ultimately, provincial legislation like Section 11.1, .1, the Marriage Act and Vital Statistics Act, and the willful silences and deliberate omissions in our K-12 curriculum continue to, and I quote from the original Breen decision, send a strong and sinister message that sexual and gender minorities are less worthy of protection and I'll add recognition as individuals in Canadian society. Ultimately, it's our sexual and gender minority youth who are coming out at younger and younger ages, now often with the full support of their families. These young people are leading the LGBTQ rights movement. This photo is from our local youth who are using their gay straight alliance clubs to not only create safe spaces to challenge discriminatory and unjust practices, their educational efforts and advocacy are fundamentally and perhaps radically changing our schools and society to come to a more complex understanding of sexual orientation and gender identity. These youth are truly leading the way and it's our legislators who are falling behind. Thank you.